All right, thank you. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a great conference, and I already learned a lot. Uh, so all what I, most at least what I'm to, what to say is joint work with Andrei Nikolic and Jake Rasmussen, and this is a part of the bigger project, which was out there for a while and continues with uh, Alexey Blanco, Vivek Shende, and more recently with Matt Hogan and Paul Vedrich. And so I'll explain some part of it, and as some people already know this, I'll try to explain it very concretely and very easily. Then. And so what is it all about? So if I have a knot K, so K is a knot, I can associate to it what is called HHH of K. So this is the logic of the homology. So this is some invariant of this knot, it's a logical invariant. It's, I will define it later today, and the definition is not so complicated, but not so easy. Uh, so what do we need to know about it right now? So this is a triply graded vector space, at least. So it has three gradients, and one of them is Essentially, homological gradient, and I can take the oligocharistic, preserve into other gradients, and the oligocharistic in the form of like the polynomial. And so sometimes it's called form of like homology, sometimes it's called form of like homology, depending on notation, sometimes it's called one redundant homology. And so, as I said, I will define it. Uh, a bit later today, but before I want to say what we actually know about this and what we want to know about this and what is this whole project about. And so the goal is to understand the structure of this homology. So until recently we didn't know much about it, but there was some recent progress and the first theorem that I want to mention is by Eliza Hoganton. <laughs> And then following up with 17, made it in 17. So let's take k to be tmn. So this is a positive torus link. And then the following is true. So first of all, this invariant of K is supported only in even homological degrees. And that is somehow a hard part. And once you know that homology is supported in even homological degrees, you can actually compute it. And so there are explicit combinatorial formulas, which I don't want to write because they're not, but there are explicit combinatorial formulas for the point replica model. So you can write either explicit sum over some natural structures, or as Elias Hogan and Hogan count, they wrote some recursions for, for it, and then you can compute this natural formula recursively. But in any case, the key part is this one. So this is kind of similar to the usual homology. If we know that we can, uh, we have some topological space, but if it's paved by even dimensional cells, we can just count all the cells. And then we can say, well, so the combinatorics of the cells defines for you homology. So then it's really a combinatorial problem. But this is the hard part, and I won't, unfortunately, prove it completely, but I guess at the third lecture, fourth lecture, I give some indication where this might come from. So what is the reason for this period? And since I'm not given combinatorial formulas, I want to give slightly different presentation. And so slightly different presentation, I need to define something. And so let's take the ring 
polynomials in x1 through xn by 1 to yn. And so on this, I have a diagonal action in SN. So I permute both x variables and y variables. And then I define an to be the sign component of it. So this is the subspace of alternating polynomial. And then I can take Jn to be an ideal generated by A. And so the simple example of this construction, if n is equal to 2, you can check that this Jn is the ideal generated by x1 minus x2 and y1 minus y2 inside polynomials in x1, x2, y1, and y2. So clearly, this and this are uh, anti-symmetric, and you can check that every anti-symmetric polynomial actually lives in the ideal generated by this thing. So that's not so hard. And so now the first theorem is that so for all k and n greater than zero so first of all j n to the power k is free and c by one by one module And then there are some explicit combinatorial formulas, which again I don't want to write down. For the so this thing is actually vibrated. So we have degree in x and degree in y, and they actually preserves this. The action of SN preserves this by gradient, and we can compute, for example, by gradient for Abinian's character. Of G and the K. And again, I'm not writing the formula, but let me just say that this is in terms of one zone. So if I have a representation of a set, I decompose it into reducibles, I can decompose it into vibrated reducibles, and then I replace each reducible by the corresponding function. And so there is some formula in the game, let's not go into it. And in particular, so from this it follows that if I just look at it, this as vibrated vector space, there is a combinatorial formula for all vibrated dimensions of all components. And it's just some formula. And so why this is relevant? Yeah, sorry, I can't do this. <laughs> We know this ideal J, then we can actually give some concrete algebraic interpretation of this result. And so here it is. So it's again a theorem. Okay. Spoken come. So if I have H H H of N K N plus one torus now. Uh, and let's re ignore one of the gradients. So there is a gradient which I don't want to consider. So this is vibrated piece of tri-graded vector space. 
And then this is basically isomorphic to Jn to the k mod xy Jn to the k as by grade vector. And so, again, like, if we have a combinatorial formula, it's nice, but it doesn't explain, like, what, what does it look like, what does the homology look like as a space. And this is a very concrete presentation of the homology as a vector space, which comes from some community of algebra, by some mysterious reason. And then, uh, another result, which is actually just mentioned, which we proved recently, it's in this nicely, so that h h h is equal to zero of n k n torus ring is the same thing now as by graded here's the one extending And all this for k bigger than zero. And so at least this is something, and again, this is I didn't explain where either of these things come from, but somehow the goal of these lectures is to explain, not to explain the proof of this result, because it's they will take a lot of time, but to explain where this answer might come from and what does it have to do with the geometry of the Hubert scheme of points on the plane. So this is somehow the main goal. And so before this, let's do an example and see what this is. Concretely. What are the x's on the left? What are the x's on the left? So if I have a link with n components, I always have a module over polynomial ring and n variables. And I'll explain why. But this is basically that's it. So this is always a module over polynomials and n variables, and then um, the right hand side is a domestically module over polynomials and x's and y's. If you kill y's, uh, then you get a module just over x's. But somehow to describe this as a module over x's, it's hard. It's not easy at all. You can describe this jn to the k by generators and relations, but that's much, much, much more complicated than writing this person. And so again, for example, if we have n is equal to 2, and let's say k is equal to 1, and so that was my ideal, j2, is the ideal generated by x1 minus x2, and y1 minus y2. Now, if I want to quotient by the maximal ideal in x's and y's, then I will get just two-dimensional vector space. So this is just the span of x1 minus x2 and y1 minus y2. And there is just two-dimensional vector space, there is not much there is not much to say, so let's call this guy z and let's call this guy. In the same way this you can think of just polynomials in axes and y's span by z and w mod the relation that x 1 minus x2 w is equal to y1 minus y2 z and so if we quotient by x and y and this just disappears and this just disappears and so again if I have j2 mod y j2 this is slightly more interesting so I have again polynomials in x, y, z, w mod the relation that x1 minus x2 w is equal to 0. And that is actually the correct answer and hopefully <coughs> we will see it later today. So this is HHH H is equal to 0 of the triple and 
that is two dimensional. The fall age is changed to three dimensional, but I just take basic to zero gradient. Uh, and here it is infinite dimensional, and it's always infinite dimensional for links, as we will see. But this is again HHH is equal to zero of t to two. And that hopefully we'll see today. And so again. So the big goal is to understand, like, so the goal of this lecture is to explain why the connection, to, why this is all related to the Hebrew schemes. And also, okay, so these are pretty special nodes, the red torus nodes, and of very special type, but actually there is a very general connection. And so explain the connection. between this result and the joint of the Heber scheme and so I have the Heber scheme of endpoints on C2 and the appearance on n axis and n y's is not so, uh, completely surprising because these are exactly n points on C2. So there's the coordinates of n points on C2. And so I will explain where this ideal comes from in terms of the Hebrew scheme. It is the space of sections of some vector bundle over there. And more generally and more importantly, What happens for more general nodes and things? But the goal for today is much more modest. I just want to explain where these answers come from for two strands. So the goal for today. So define HHH. HHH. And compute it for C2 and C2 3. So, in particular, I would like to convince you that this answer is correct. introduction to what we expect, what we know, what we want. So what do we actually do? So first of all, let me recall some things about nodes and links. And so first of all, we have gray group, as much as possible. So we have generators, sigma 1 and n. And the relations are the sigma i, sigma i plus 1, sigma i, Sigma plus one, sigma and sigma j, sigma j, sigma j, sigma j, far apart. And so, again, as we seen in previous talk, you can draw these things so you can represent sigma i as a positive crossing between i and i plus first strands of some ray. And then we compose these things by stacking one on top of another. And why do we need braids? Because there is a class called Theorem of Alexander. 
And we said that every link can be presented as a closure of some braid. And so what I mean by the closure, I mean that, that I have a braid, some inputs and outputs, and then I close it like this. But it can be presented in many different ways. So another theorem, Markov, again very classical, is that so beta one and beta two have the same closure. If and only if they're related by a sequence of moves. So there are two types of moves. First, if I have alpha and beta, I can swap the order. And then the closure of this is the same as the closure of beta alpha. And another thing is that if I have beta, then this is the same as beta. is one extra strand, like this, and so if I close this up, then I can undo this, and so this is the same thing. And this crossing could be positive and negative. And so why these theorems are important? Because we can construct some topological invariants of links by constructing invariants of braids, which are invariant under this and that. And braids are much more algebraic objects than things. Fj is not equal to y and n plus 1. 
And so uh, what's written here is that I tensor R with R over polynomials invariant under this. So these polynomials are precisely xi plus xi plus 1 and xi xi plus 1. And so this is called the Zurkin bimodal. It's an example of the Zurkin bimodal. And this is, by definition, it's RR bimodal. So we have left action by xi. And we have right action by xi prime. And so if you have bimodules, we try to do various things with them. So the picture for this BI is that I have a lot of strands and then I have a double line between i and i plus 1. And so one can imagine that I have x, the variables xi, x1 through xn downstairs, and xi prime, so x1 prime through xn prime upstairs. And so what happens is that all other variables just go to themselves and i and i plus 1 merge and then split but we don't know if they stay the same or if they are interchanged. And so the matrix metric functions of them are the same but maybe the interchange maybe they're not. So that's the standard picture. And then there are some facts. So I think I don't need the full category of the Rigby modules, but let me say some facts. That first of all, bi tensor bi is isomorphic to bi plus qbi, where as in the previous talk, this is the gradient shift. And so, again, pictorially, I want to draw it, maybe not, but you can put one thing on top of another and then you have some picture like this. And so I have to explain what this tensor product means. Again, this is kind of obvious, but I still want to say this. So this is uh, bimodules over R on the left and on the right, and this is bimodules over R on the left and on the right, and we have tensor over R. So graphically, we have always a product if we have some bimodule here and send my model here. We stack them and we say that if x is bimodial over the variables here and here and y is bimodial over variables here and here, we put tensor over middle set of variables. So I think that's always good to say. And so how to prove this? Again, I don't want to prove it in this big generality, but uh, let me raise it as an exercise which is easier. So if I have b bar, which is just the polynomials in x and x prime in one variable, modular relation that x squared is equal to x prime squared. So this is again a bimodule over QF. And then the exercise says that the same is true for u bar. And that's really easy to check, and then this is essentially the same. Okay, and so how this helps understand the braids and things? You can make it a bit wet. What? You can make it a bit wet, maybe. Yeah, maybe.
So now we can another path, which I also want to prove that there is a map. From the I R to this B I, and there is another map from R to B I, map to B I star, and I will not write the ratios, but I can, but, but uh, no bother. And so we can define B I to be the complex. To be the cone of this thing. And we define the inner to be the cone of the map from R to the I. Now this is really a complex of the I's where bimodules, this is really a two-term complex of bimodules.
All right. And so, what's corollary? So corollary is that if I break beta, they can, I can define a complex, let's call this Q of beta. Q of beta, F of beta. Q of beta. So this is a complex of our bimodules. Uh, which is defined up to And so if I have rate B that I can decompose it as a product of elementary crossings. For each elementary crossing I assign either this complex or that complex, tensor all of them, and because they satisfy rate relations, I know that the result doesn't depend on presentation of beta, except that maybe I need some complex. So this is a complex of R R by module. So what do we know about this? So in terms of the two actions of R. So remark is that the left action of so the left action of Xi on Q theta is homotopic to the right action of x w phi prime where w in a sense is a permutation corresponding to beta. So the picture here is that I have some braid, some complicated structure. So I can look at i here and I can act by xi on the bottom. Or I can act as x w of i on the top. And the actions are the same because you can somehow slide this dot through all the crossings. And this is a very useful remark in many. All right. And so we're almost there. Ah, so before defining homology, let me actually compute this thing for T22. So I promise to do this for T22. So another example. Is that what is T to two? Well, I say that it's torso braid or torso ring. What is it concretely? So this is a closure of the following braid, and you can't see this braid. Okay? No. Okay. You can't see something. Please tell me. Here. So this is the braid that you want to close, and then you get just a coupling, which is T22 torus link. So this is, by this assignment, this is the square of symbol crossing, <coughs> and so I can say that this is the square of this one would be I to R, squared, and so this is, again, this is just equal to three term complex, BI squared, This is the same as the complex bi squared goes to 2bi minus 4. And then again we use the fact 
there's bi squared and bi plus bi. And so we see that this is the same thing as this. So if you want to keep track of the graining, then you actually put Q here. It's not so important. So you can simplify the complexes. And in general, so it is not so hard to check that if you have T2 from N, then this will be complex when I have some part of Q, fine, when I have B1, goes to B1, goes to B1, B1, goes to R. At least if N is positive, and here I have N of N. So that's some fairly concrete computation. Again, if we just define it by definition, we have to take N power of this complex. But when we do all the simplifications, and use this part, then we have a complex like this. You can write the maps very explicitly. They alternate between even and odd terms, and there are some gradients, which again, let's not bother. Okay, and so the last ingredient. Computation. Ah, and also another remark, well, I'm reading, so, this complex is very nice, but in general it's very complicated. So this is, I would say, the seemingly simple set of examples. So in general, like if, at least if you try to do it by definition, for each crossing you have a two-term complex. So if you tensor all the things, you get two to the number of crossings term in the complex. And each, in each term is actually a bimodule complicated structure because it's the product of all these BIs. And so this complex is really, really complicated. And it's nice that we can do it for two strands, but already for three strands, by definition, it's almost impossible to compute anything. So that's somehow why we're doing all this, because if you try to attack this by definition, you fail almost immediately. And so the last ingredient is we need to take homology of this complex, but we need to take it in some strange way, which may be not so strange for most people in the audience. So we define HHH of beta to be R form from R to T of beta. Where by R form I mean that I resolve R. So here I mean that we resolve R by free R R by modules. And e we take home from each term there, and then we take a module of the resulting complex. It's pretty the thing. So if you don't want to think about this, so the thing which is slightly easier to understand and which is slightly more intrinsic actually to the Zorbi story is this a is equal to zero. So this is just home from R to T of beta. Right? So I ignore this higher A degrees. And so this is triply graded. So, first of all, we have Q grading, which was implicitly there already. So, this is, we just say that all BI are graded. And all morphisms are graded are homogeneous of some degree. And so, we just take this gradient and carry it from the gradient of BI. And BI, well, it's ideal generated by some homogeneous. For the moment, it's an excellent spread. And then we have the T gradient. This is the homological gradient. In this complex T of beta. So 
So each term in this complex is graded, but actually we can say like where it is. So there's another grading, and then there is. And I don't want to use Q and T for this, but well, okay, for today it's fine, because I will use slightly different notation for Q and T. Let me use Q capital for continuity. Sorry. So let me use Q capital and T capital for this. Because like my favorite choice of Q and T is it's some combination of this and it's different. So here, this is what A equals zero. Uh, A is common. No, this is A equals to zero. Sorry. So all these, both this and this, they have two gradings, Q and T, and this has additional grading A, which comes from this derived R form. T of theta is already a complex. Will be by complex. Yeah, I take this particular complex, which is defined up to homotopy, and then I take essentially R form to each term of this complex, and then I take homology. I'll do an example in a second. But homology is a thing that depends on the quality, even on the quality as a No, it's home between complexes. I mean, you can think of this as home and category of complexes. So this is a complex, and that is a complex, and then you have homotopy category of complexes, and then homotopy category of complexes, you have low defined form. So uh, I'll give an example in a second how this works. It's important that, I mean, what is important is that we really work out the homotopy. We don't want the derived category. We don't work out the quasi isomorphism. If it would be quasi isomorphism, it would be slight difference, right? Yes, it doesn't matter. For this, the answer will be kind of trivial in some sense. But I mean if, if we ignore this R form, this part is certainly well defined and there is no problem there. There you kind of talk about bicomplex, either contract or not, but here it's perfectly fine. Okay, anyway, so and then there is another gradient which is I call A or so A is a half of it essentially and then So this is the gradient of our home. And again, if A is equal to zero, capital A is equal to zero, small A is equal to zero, it's all the same. And then we just take the usual form instead of our form. It is. Yes, I'll mention this in the end of it. Yes. Okay. So this is equal to zero is really zero is total model as well. So what's the relation between the middle A and big A? Uh up to some skin. We'll just have the next time. I mean again that this this A is equal to zero and capital A is equal to zero is really the same. It just I mean so, I mean, in particular, this theorem that I was mentioning about the Hebrew scheme. So there are two natural gradients which are degree in x and degree in y. And I prefer to call them q, q small and t small. So these degrees are not those degrees. There are some combinations of these degrees, like qt squared or something. And that's why, that's why the difference. Um, sorry. So I recall, uh, if I remember correctly, I have seen a version where it is tensorful over alpha instead of alpha. Uh, that's right, it's like Oshu Kamoshu and Oshu Kokamoshu, they're the same after the gradient. Mm -hmm. Right, so now, what is the definition actually? So, so this is the definition and then the theorem on Kavana. Is that HHH on Hida satisfies is invariant. After grading sheet. Under Markov moves. 
So that's a check that one can do, and then if this is done, then this is a topological invariance of him. Check the scan relation. And so this is defined. 
where water has the final kilos. But again, after some recreating, we get something like this. And so the idea is again in this land of uh, complexes and homology, this is definitely not true, but we have exact sequence relating these three terms. And then if we take order patristic, it becomes additive. And so that's how this is essentially proved. And then the second remark, since we know us, is that so we have, so this depends on A and Q. And we know that, for example, Kavanagh homology is A is equal to Q squared and Q. So this is the Johnson homology. And you can ask, uh, can we do this A is equal to Q squared substitution for homology? And the answer is yes, but it's much more complicated. So the theorem of Rasmussen. says that there is a spectral sequence from A to J of K to Kavanagh homology of K. So Kavanagh homology is going to codify Jones polynomial. Uh, and you can define the Kavanov homology in a similar fashion. I don't have time for this, but you can definitely define this. So if you ever seen this bimodal presentation, then this DI they kind of correspond to this bimodal for Kavanov homology, and then there are some relations which are slightly different and homology is slightly different. But again the important point is that so if you substitute A is equal to Q square, naively you would say that nothing happens. But it turns out that essentially you cancel minus a with q squared, and there is a differential which does it. And then here, in principle, if you have a differential on the complex, you have the spectral sequence on the homology. And so that's where it comes from, and maybe it's important to mention that all these things about parity and nice properties of homologies of those things, they're definitely not true for Kavan homology. Another remark is that the parity does not hold for Kavanaugh or let's say Torres not. And basically because we collapse some gradients in the spectral sequence and also we introduce some additional differentials, so this is definitely not true. And it's definitely the simplest examples, you can see that homology is supported in both even and mod homological degrees. And so somehow this kind of indicates that complex homology, which is defined in more complicated way than Kavanaugh homology, is actually easier. And it has easier properties and maybe the interesting strategy of computing Kavanaugh homology is first compute HHH, which we now at least know how to compute in some examples, and then try to compute the spectral sequence explicitly, which is maybe possible, maybe not, but there are some conjectures about it. So we have some conjectures for some torus notes how the spectral sequence looks like, and the result is, so the outcome for Kavanaugh homology is really complicated, you can compare it to actual computer computations and that's worse, but it's just very, very complicated and much worse than this. Yes? Well, it should be not so hard to compute since the spectral sequence conversion is 7H, right? So you can just put a differential on the yes. common of Kazansky homology and compute the homology differential. Yeah, you, don't, you just don't know what the differential is. So somehow you have the process of simplifying homology. So you know like the base of homology, but essentially like what, what happens in the You'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, it, it, it. 
I don't know. Like, I don't know the answer to it. I mean, there are some conjectures. We think that we know how the spectral sequence looks like in some examples, and it's pretty complicated already. All right, and the remaining zero minus. Right. So let me, okay, let me finish this computation next time. Or two, two, let's see. Here, yes, we have. Oh, the so oh, here we have some complex. So here we have essentially this Ti, here we have Ti inverse, yeah. and here we have just R. And the copies of R connecting by some differential. Okay. And then there is explicit the short exact sequence in homology. You take what you're and then it becomes. Yeah. And, and you need to take like some kind of uh, reduced homology or something, right? Because yes, you have I mean, this Q minus Q minus one. That's within just some kind of infinite sum or something? No, no? you might mean uh, there are two terms. This is like a complex, so on the right hand side you'll get some like. Uh, I'm trying to be, if you look back at, um, I don't know. So you have an exact triple connect in Ti, Ti inverse, and the complex when you have stuff like R goes to R by. Uh, <coughs> something like that. Uh, so if you take one of the characteristics of this, this will be this times one. Like Q minus Q inverse or one minus Q. Yeah, I mean there there are reduced versions, there are unreduced versions. I don't. Maybe we'll talk about this next time. It's not so important. For I mean, you said um, so you will produce some implicit formulas uh, for torus knots. Is yeah. it explicit enough to allow explicit formulas for the width in some sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean there are very explicit recursions. You can like. Programming and see it in for any torus knot, it, it, it's very fast. No, no, but is, is it enough to produce an say, explicit formula for, I don't know, Come 10, on, sure. 10 n torus knot and its width or something? More like in t direction? Or like yes. in, yeah, I think so. I, mean, I think I may know the answer, but yes. Uh, do I know the answer? Because we still don't know what the width of. Well, width of Kavanov is smaller than that, but that is, yeah, that I think we know. That's about like a minus one and minus one or two, something like that. It's like both the I think. Maybe I'm a bit too wide, but I think that's right. But anyway, I mean, from this algorithm, yes, you can see it. Right. If there are other questions, I'll thank the speaker again.